Welcome to our JavaScript web course. In this video, we will cover conditional statements and loops. A conditional statement allows you to execute code based on a condition being true or to do something else if the condition is not true. We have already looked at a simple if conditional statement. Here we are evaluating one condition. And if that condition returns true, the code inside the curly braces will execute. If that condition does not return true, nothing will happen. We have also looked at a simple if else conditional statement. If the condition inside the if is evaluated to be true, the code inside the curly braces will execute. Here we also have an else block. If the condition in the if evaluates to be false, the code inside the else block will execute. So in this case, code will be executed if the condition is false and also if the condition is true. It is possible to nest conditional statements. However, it is not recommended because it can become very complicated. Here we have a nested if inside of our first if block. So if this condition is true, again, the code inside the curly braces will execute. In this case, the code is a nested if. So we would evaluate that if, and because it's an if else, in either case, code will be executed. However, if the outer if evaluates to be false, then the code inside the else will execute and the nested if will not be run. Up until now, we have been testing for one condition. There are times when you may want to test for several conditions that are somehow related. In this case, you can do what is called chain the if else statements so that we actually have an else if block. So if you look at this code, we have an if with a condition. If this condition evaluates to true, we execute the code. However, if that condition does not evaluate to true, then we go on to the else if. If this condition returns true, then we execute that code. However, if it does not return true, then we go on to the next else if. If this condition returns true, then we execute the code. If not, we go on and on and on. Finally, if none of the conditions are true, we have a final else which will execute in the event that none of the above are true. I would like to point out that the code stops when it finds the first true. If more than one conditions are true, it will never find the next one, so make sure your logic is correct. We also have a switch statement. The switch statement is an easier alternative to chaining an if-else conditional. So if we were evaluating a condition that returned true or false, we are testing to see if it is true. And when we find the first true, we will exit the switch However, if none of the conditions are true, then we will exit the default code. So we have the switch keyword, we have the opening left curly brace, and the closing right curly brace. The conditions are placed inside the parentheses after the case keyword, and this expression is followed by the colon. So we have a different syntax for setting up our conditions. So here we have case num1 equals equals num2 colon. If this condition is true, we will execute the code. We also need to place the break statement after that to break out of the switch. If this is not true, we go on to the next case. We evaluate that condition. If that condition is true, the code is executed and we break out of the switch. If it is not true, we go on to the next case. 
If that's not true, we go on to the next case and the next case. If none of the above evaluate to true, then the code after the default keyword will be executed. Notice that this takes up a lot less space to write than a chained if else conditional statement. So we are evaluating these conditions to the true because of the nature of the condition. We are using comparison operators and we could also be using logical operators and remember these types of operators evaluate to true or false. You can also use a switch statement as you can with a chained else if to evaluate the value of a variable. And in this case, you would place the value to which you are comparing inside the parentheses after the switch keyword. So each case statement would have a value to which we're comparing it to. And if we do not find a match with any of these case statements, then the default code will be executed. There is a shorthand for writing an if-else statement that I would like to point out. This uses what is called the conditional operator or the ternary operator. So let's review our basic if-else statement first. So here we have an if and the condition. If the condition is true, we execute the code inside the curly braces else, meaning the condition is not true, we execute the code inside the else curly braces. And notice inside both of my blocks of code here, we are setting a value for a variable. So based on the condition being true or false, we are setting a value for this variable. Here we have that same variable result equals. It equals the condition. Then we have a question mark. After the question mark, we have the value to be set for that variable if the condition returns true. Then we have a colon. So if the condition is not true, then we set this value for that variable to the right of the colon. So rather than using the if and the curly braces, we use the question mark for the code to be executed if it is true, we use the colon for the code to be executed if it is false. We also have loops in JavaScript. Loops are used to perform repeated tasks based on a condition. So the code will be executed over and over until the condition is no longer true. The most commonly used loop is a for loop. So let's take a look at this syntax. Here I have the for keyword, and in parentheses, I am initializing a variable i to zero. You will typically see i being used to represent a counter. However, sometimes developers might use x. So we are initializing i to zero, semicolon, our condition, i is less than 5, semicolon, and now we have an increment, i++. Plus plus. Technically, that increment doesn't happen until we have executed the code for the first time. Inside the curly braces, we have the code to be executed, and I am placing the value of i in this code so that you can see the value of i as we execute this code. So I have declared a variable and set it to an empty string. We will be assigning a value to that variable. However, every time we go through this loop, we're going to be assigning more value to that variable. So I am using the plus equal operator, the add and assign operator, because we will be adding to value of this variable. In this box, I have the output. So the first time round, i is 0. Then we increment to 1. Second time round, it is 1. We increment. Third time round, it is 2. We increment. 
Fourth time round it is three, we increment. Fifth time round it is four. When we increment the next time, our value of i will be five, and our condition i less than five will no longer be true. So at this point, the loop will stop. We also have a while loop. The while loop will repeat the code for as long as the condition is true. When we look at the syntax, here is the while keyword, and in our parentheses we have the condition, and our increment is actually after we execute this code. We initialize our variable i outside of the, the while keyword. It is not initialized in the parentheses as with the for loop. So this statement will be executed as long as the condition is true. So we're starting out with i equals 0. The condition is i is less than 10. So it will continue to run until i is 10. And at that point, the condition will be false and the loop will end. We also have a do while loop. The do while loop is very similar to the while loop. However, the syntax is different. We have the do keyword. The code inside the curly braces will be executed. Then we increment. Then we have our condition. If the condition is true, we will run this code again. If the condition is not true, the loop will stop. However, because the code is executed first before we test for the condition, the code will always run at least once, even if the condition is not true. And you can see in this example, the condition is i being greater than 10, which it is not. So therefore, the condition is false. Finally, I would like to discuss the prompt method of the window object, which can be used to obtain user input. The prompt is very similar to the alert in that it places a box on top of the window and the user has to click either OK or Cancel to get rid of that box. The box contains a text box and if the user places a value in that text box, we can use that value somehow. Prompt method takes two parameters. The first parameter is the statement that you will display on top of the text box which is telling the user what you would like them to enter. And the next parameter is optional. It gives the user more information of what you would want them to enter. Because the prompt will contain a value, I can assign this whole expression to a variable. And now I can use this variable in my application somewhere. The prompt is not really used in today's world. It has its origin over 20 years ago in early JavaScript. Most of the time today, we will create our own boxes using CSS or use a form to obtain user input.